No mai, haere mai, kia ora tato, and welcome to the fourth episode in the Auckland Writers Festival Winter Series. I am your host, Paula Morris, dialing in from my living room in Grays Avenue, Auckland. Now, this is the first time in the Winter Series that I've actually met all three writers before, so I'm delighted to be talking to them this morning. Thank you to our very generous venue and technical partner, Auckland Live, and to Copyright Licensing New Zealand for their support in making this series possible. Uh, many of you will know by now how each episode in the Winter Series works. We welcome all three writers. I chat with them in turn about their latest book and they each do a short reading. You too can ask questions throughout using the chat functions on Facebook and YouTube. I will be checking for questions and will try to ask them if possible after each reading. Towards the end of our hour, all three writers will return for a final question or two. Now, please share this episode of the Winter Series via social media, and remember this series is free to view. So please ignore any mischievous requests for credit cards, and don't click on any links in the comments unless those links are supplied by the Auckland Writers Festival. And one final reminder, the writers' books we're discussing today are all available for sale or order just click on the buy the book link in the episode description. Now, also all three of our writers today were scheduled to appear at this festival. And let's just uh, say hello to them all. Please join me in welcoming in New York, Deborah Eisenberg. Kia ora, Deborah. Uh, hello, hello. It's just, it's great to be in New Zealand for an hour. <laughs> I wish it were longer. Hi. And uh, sitting right next to you suspiciously is Wallace Shawn. Hello, everybody. Wish we were there, but thrilled to be here. Just Jonah great. Wally. And uh, joining us somewhat closer to home from Point Chevalier here in Auckland is Caroline Barron. Ngā mihi nui kia tato. Good morning, everyone. Kia ora, Caroline. Now, um, we're going to begin with Deborah today. So Caroline is going to disappear and Wally is going to tilt the screen, maybe? Or are you just going to sit there and look at her adoringly? Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. So it's as though he was never there all along. So Deborah, I'm going to give you a quick introduction and, and try not to glance at it. We begin today with Deborah Eisenberg, one of the greatest short story writers in the English language. Deborah grew up in the Chicago suburbs and moved to New York where she, when she was in her 20s, and that's where she is today. Over the past three decades, her short stories have appeared in the numerous places, including the Paris Review, The New Yorker, Tin House, and she's published five superb collections, including the most recent, Your Duck is My Duck. The New York Times called her short stories one of the most original and accomplished bodies of work in contemporary literature, and that is no exaggeration. When I worked at Tulane University in New Orleans, we conceived a writer's writer series, and the first person we invited was Deborah Eisenberg, so well respected as she, so admired by other writers. Those of you who attended last year's Auckland Writers Festival may remember the Canadian novelist Patrick DeWitt citing Your Duck is My Duck as a book he absolutely loved. Now, Deborah has taught writing at the University of Virginia and Columbia University, and she's received many awards, including a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant and a Guggenheim Fellowship. We're honored to have her with us. Deborah, tēnā koe and welcome. Thank you so much. So great to be here. It's lovely to see you. Now, your first collection, Transactions in a Foreign Currency, was the first short story collection I ever bought when I was a grad student in the UK, probably around 1986. I hold you partly responsible for my love of the form, and I wondered why stories the, fo the form you chose for your work. Well, you know, it's really quite mysterious. I think I was just born with uh, a certain length encoded in my genes because I'd love to write longer, I'd love to write shorter, but I write at this very eccentric length. But I should say that uh, there's a strange uh, sort of circular current here because when I was really a little child, there was a book on my parents' bookcase that I was drawn to over and over and over. And it was, 
I have no understanding of what I was reading at all, but I just loved it. And I thought it was a children's book because it was very tall and the typeface was very large and there were line drawings in it. And it was a collection of stories by Catherine Mansfield. So um, you could say that that was the first, my, that was my introduction to uh, short stories. And I've really never gotten over those stories. They, they're still one of my favorite things in the world. Well, this is the headline now from the session that New Zealand claims Deborah Eisenberg as our own uh, <laughs> direct <laughs> influence. I mean, like, I mean, you, Catherine Mansfield obviously had a short life, so her body of work is relatively small. You're not a writer who anyone would really describe as prolific. I mean, unlike someone like, say, T.C. Boyle, who, who publishes a lot of collections, there are long gaps between yours. And I was thinking myself, I was thinking, oh, it's not that long since Twilight of the Superheroes, your last collection. It's actually 12 years. Though, of course, many stories were published in the, in the interim. You used the word eccentric just before, and I wondered, is, is this your eccentric pace as well for writing? Is it intentional? This, this more languid pace in terms of publications? No, there's nothing intentional about it. I would, uh, I, it's very, very frustrating to be as slow a writer as I am. In fact, I'm a very slow everything. I read slowly, I do things slowly, and it just takes me a very, very long time to locate what it is that I'm doing on paper or with electrons, whatever it is, it takes me a long time. There's nothing I could do about it. I'm just thinking, listening to you speak about a, quite a famous answer you gave to your Paris Review Art of Fiction interviewer, who was asking you how you begin a story. I often cite it with my own students. You said, I never start with anything. And then you said, there is nothing in my mind when I'm writing until I'm well along in a piece. Until then, I have no ideas, no conscious feeling. Is this still true for you? Oh, yes, yes, even, even more. I, I mean, among my crackpot theories, I suppose, is uh, the notion that artists of any sort really don't have conscious feelings. It all, it all happens on the piece of paper, the canvas, the, the uh, music paper, whatever it is, that's where the, that's the conduit for the feeling. And I've certainly, I have no imagination and I have no ideas. So. <laughs> I love hearing this, but now you say you have no imagination, but of course you do, because I know generally you don't like to write autobiographically at all. No. Um, there is, I, I wondered if there's a slight exception and one of the stories in this new collection, the marvelous story, Cross Off and Move On, there is a little something in there of your own grandparents' complicated immigrant past with someone claiming to be from Vienna and St. Petersburg, when in fact the, the narrator, the point of view character's mother insists they were smuggled out of some sewer in the Ukraine. And there are also parallels with your grandfather arriving in the US, making a fortune, losing a fortune in the depression. And I wondered, are you at this point in your writing life willing to admit real life a little more into your fiction? What an interesting question. I think uh, that must be the case because that story is far and away the most autobiographical story. And uh, as, I mean, there are a lot of things in it that are not autobiographical. For instance, in the story, there's really no father around. My father happened to be very much around. Uh, my mother uh, didn't work in a club, uh, things like that. But the character of the mother in that story, I have to say is very much my mother. And I never, I've never gone anywhere near her before, never. And um, it was always as if there was a ring of fire around her and I never wanted to write about her. 
And I didn't really intend to write about her, but she's very much in that character, uh, including a few rather terrifying quotations. <laughs> and um, also the house in the story was my paternal grandmother's house. That house really was that house. It's a wonderful description of the house, I have to say. And anyone who wants a masterclass, any writers out there who want a masterclass in writing settings should read that story. Deborah, the, this notion of the unknowability of the past or the secret lives of the immediate generations before us seems to me to surface in a number of the stories here, including the really wonderful Taj Mahal and also recalculating. And I, I wondered, I was thinking about the, the younger point of view characters who may be middle-aged in these stories. Maybe it's because the older generation are often performers. The, the younger ones seem to lead more ordinary lives. And I wondered for you, is the past with its intrinsic mystery always going to seem more extraordinary to the generations that follow? Oh, that is so well put. I think that that's absolutely true. And somehow content is transmitted <clears throat> in such mysterious ways. And I think maybe everybody, but certainly a lot of people grow up with longings that they can't quite identify for something in the past that they don't quite know about. Um, but yes, there's, uh, you know, as, as humans were pulled in two directions through time towards the future and towards the past. And there is just something um, very, very, uh, what is the word that just flew out of my head? Uh, it isn't alluring, but something like that. Um, lustrous uh, about the past that um, uh, delicious and lustrous, even if it's horrible and terrifying, but that it's something that's missing from your own life that you feel to be missing. I don't know if that made any sense. No, absolutely. And it's something we're going to be talking more when we talk to Caroline Barron a little later. Deborah, right. will you give us a reading from uh, Your Duck is My Duck now, please? I think you're going to read from the title story, are you not? Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, I have to have notes, so I can't remember what I have to say. Uh, but I thought I would read a little passage from that story that might at least shed some light on why it is the title of the story <laughs> there for the book. Um, but that, that passage is not the beginning of the story and it's an extremely complicated involved story. So I have to give you some context, I'm sorry. Uh, so for various reasons that I'm not going to go into, the narrator of the story is an artist. She's a painter. She's absolutely broke, very worried. And she has just gotten where I'm going to start. She's just gotten off a very long plane trip from freezing cold New York City. And she's going to have a restorative, comfortable stay at the beach vacation home of a fabulously wealthy, fabulously stylish couple whom she hardly knows. Um, their names are Ray and Krista. So Krista has picked up the exhausted, disoriented narrator at the airport and was complaining that there are a lot of boring accountants or something around their place because Ray is in the middle of some deal to acquire a new company. And that's something that always makes him nervous. So it's dinner time that night and the narrator has just put down her stuff in the little house on the property where she'll be staying. She's struggled over to the main house for dinner where Krista and Ray and the accountants are sitting down at an immense dinner table for a lavish dinner.
whoops. Um, I watched through the glass wall as evening slowly began to rise in the bowl of the valley below and soft lights glimmered on. The soft mauve twilights were rising around the table and somewhere in that gently swirling dusk, the accountants were talking among themselves, telling jokes, it seemed. Their bursts of raucous laughter sounded like reams of paper being shredded. And after each burst, they would instantly sober up and swivel deferentially around to Ray. What language are they speaking? I whispered to Krista. You really better drink some water, she said. It was English, I realized, but specialized. One of them was finishing up a joke that seemed to concern a pilgrim, a turkey, a squaw, and something called credit swap rates. They all laughed raucously again. Ray was drumming his fingers on the table, making a sound of distant thunder. The accountants swiveled around to him again with sweet boys' faces, and he stood up abruptly. Gentlemen, he said with a tiny bow, I have a great deal to gain from this transaction, assuming it all proceeds as anticipated. But if at zero hour, by some mishap, it should fall through, let me remind you that owing to the billable hours clause, you were so kind as to append to our contract, only you will be the losers. I salute your efforts. I have the highest hope for your sake, as well as mine, that your irrepressible confidence in them is justified. But perhaps a moment of sobriety is in order at this point, a moment of reflection about the tenuous nature of careers. Or to put it another way, don't think for a moment that if the boat is scuttled, I'll throw you my rope. I'm sure you all recall the Zen riddle about the great Zen master, his disciple, and the duck trapped in the bottle. He drained his large glass of wine, glug, glug, glug. Everyone recall the master's lesson? It's not my duck. It's not my bottle. It's not my problem. He slammed his empty glass down on the table and wheeled out. What did I tell you? Krista said. What did she tell me? I had no idea. Thank you very much, Deborah. That was brilliant. I, you are such a terrific reader. And that is a story that is very strange and unsettling and funny. It's now you had to give obviously context for the reader. And I'm thinking that many critics will compare your stories to novels in order to praise their heft or their depth or the or the scope of the story. This also happens, as you know, to Alice Munro. Why do you think the novel is so often seen as the default and as though readers must be reassured that a story will suffice? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, uh, a story is really, I, I've suffered from this horribly uh, my whole writing life, uh, that stories are really seen as the kiddie form somehow, even by a lot of writers. And of course, I'm always just horribly offended uh, to say nothing of incredibly irritated because, um, uh, and I've actually irritably said that when I've been asked, how do you go about writing a story? I'd say, well, I start with the novel and then I cut out the stuff that shouldn't be there. Um, it, uh, I think really novels are reassuring, first of all, because we're accustomed to them. We all love them. I mean, I love them, uh, but they're long. So they seem to be for grownups. They're the, you know, it's, that's the big kid form. Of course, stories compressed, um, 
layered, if they're any good, subtle. Uh, and I always think of Isaac Babel, who did in a page and a half with the story I probably most love that's called, usually called in English, Crossing into Poland. Everything in the world is in that story, in a page and a half, everything in the world. Absolutely. Deborah, I'm, I really would, you know, we were supposed to talk for an hour, you and me, at the festival, but obviously we, time is shorter these days, so please hang tight. Um, but you might need to move your screen now towards Wallace there. I can see him peeking up. And, and we'll come back to talk to you more at the, at the end of our time together because it's so absolutely fascinating. Now, sitting next to you is a very fascinating person also, Wallace Shawn, acclaimed playwright essayist and actor known for his wit, intellectual range and restless curiosity about the world, as well as what's been called the Baroque extravagance of his imagination. His plays have been performed at New York's Public Theatre, the Royal Court and National Theatres in London, among other places. He's won two Obie Awards and three of his plays have been made into films. Uh, he's currently turning two into podcasts, which we can talk about in a moment. His collaborations with Andre Gregory and Louis Malle include My Dinner with Andre and Vanya on 42nd Street. And of course, he's appeared as an actor in other much loved films as diverse as Manhattan, The Princess Bride and Clueless. His most recent book is Night Thoughts, an extended essay that roams art, politics and philosophy and meditates on the disparities between the lucky and unlucky in the world. Fellow playwright David Hare has called him a bracing antidote to the op-ed dreariness of political and artistic journalism in the West. He takes you back to the days when intellectuals had the wit and concentration to formulate great questions and to make the reader want to answer them. Kia ora, welcome again, Wally. Hey. Hello. Um, great to see you again. Wally, let's, let's talk about something you say in Night Thoughts. You describe self-deception as a thunderingly powerful force in human affairs and say none of us are exempt from it. But you are very candid about yourself and your desire for comfort. You say, my manliness gauge stands at more than half empty. And I wondered, is that tension between self-deception and self-interrogation at the heart of much of your work? Phew. Well, um, pardon me. I feel embarrassed. Deborah is so articulate. I am totally inarticulate. Um, but um, I suppose I just um, noted early on that uh, most people very predictably and boringly uh, praise themselves whenever an opportunity comes up. And uh, I don't know, I guess I decided early on that that was just incredibly boring and not very convincing when people, you know, praise themselves. Um, so I suppose I, I uh, set my sights on, on self uh, mockery or self-destruction or something like that uh, pretty pretty early. Um, and I, I uh, of course, theater is the form that I've worked in mostly and plays are mostly about uh, try to make the audience feel good about themselves. And uh, so that is very repetitive and, and boring. And uh, I don't know, I, I've always been angry and upset that the audience for plays that I have been able to find have been mostly uh, bourgeois people like myself. And somehow it's led me to writing plays that are uh, uh, critical of myself and the people like me in the audience. And yeah, 
so I suppose that's, uh, um, I don't know, it's true of my essays also. Now, if, I mean, I'm sure many of our viewers will know that your father, William Sean, was a longtime editor of The New Yorker and you studied at Oxford, you studied at Harvard, you, I believe, originally thought about being a diplomat. Now, in this, um, in this essay, you talk about growing up with privilege, with books and music at home, and the expectation that the purpose of life was to be happy. Now, you say that your luck is held despite downward mobility that you talk about very amusingly all the way through, a downward mobility compared with your parents. And I wondered, because we rewatched uh, My Dinner with Andre last night, if that notion of a lucky life and, and the seeking comfort is an issue that, that first surfaced for you many years ago and you're still teasing it out in your work. Yes, I, I've... It's sort of... Well, it's sort of the only interesting thing about me in a way. And so I have, uh, I've written about it a lot. And um, uh, obviously there are a lot of people who grow up privileged and to uh, set their mind to work on how to uh, lead a different sort of life. There are people who have actually uh, not just climbed a few steps down on the status or, or income level, but they've climbed way, way down and uh, writers or actors or other artists who've, who've led uh, really humble bohemian lives and I, uh, I don't know, I fell into this business of being an actor and, and immediately uh, uh, they were paying me well for doing that. And um, so I had the luck of birth and I was beginning the climb downward and then I had the luck of, of uh, achieving some success as an amusing uh, character actor. And so I sort of started climbing back up and I didn't, what, for whatever reason, I didn't have what it took to, uh, you know, not climb. I, I enjoyed those checks. And I am a hedonist who enjoys uh, a lot of things that uh, money uh, can buy, uh, including uh, going to nice concerts and, and uh, uh, travel, uh, going to even restaurants. So I've, I've, I, I, didn't stop. I, I kept on with that uh, uh, earning the checks, uh, really. I mean, I've had uh, periods where people lost interest in my acting and the checks weren't coming. But uh, I, when the jobs were offered, I usually uh, took them. I mean, not the nauseating ones. Uh, but uh, anything that wasn't nauseating, I, I would usually do. It's a good and, principle in life, right? Don't take the nauseating jobs. Well, I think, yeah, that's how I've lived. There's a big potential for self-deception there because if you want the check, you may decide that it isn't so bad when it really is. Um, but uh, so I've sort of, stayed in a privileged category for most of my life. And uh, so it's been a natural subject for me to, to write about, really. Um, Wally, we, could, could we talk about, um, just briefly about your play, Grasses of a Thousand Colors? Uh, Tom and I saw it at the Royal Court, I guess it was a decade or so ago. And at the time it was described as a, a feverish portrait of male egomania threatening to waste the planet. 
And uh, Tom and I were talking about it this week and he said it feels very prescient now. And I wonder, do you think we're living through a different sort of apocalyptic tragedy comedy at this moment in, in the world? Uh, well, I uh, thank you for mentioning that uh, play. We're, we're about to make a podcast of it and we've just done the podcast of The Designated Mourner. I mean, it's flattering to think that uh, writers know about the future. <laughs> I don't know if there's any truth in it. I mean, I think if you read science fiction, there are probably thousands of stories and books about uh, you know, strange dystopian situations, including an illness that, you know, sort of takes over the planet, which does happen in grasses of a thousand colors. Um, I, I, uh, I haven't read much science. Well, I haven't, yeah, I've hardly read any science fiction. So I would say, uh, I don't, I don't know, but I assume there are countless stories like that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I do think that writers know about their own time a little bit. I mean, mostly they have nothing else to do but examine it. Uh, and uh, so the seeds of, you know, the future are there in the present. Oh, absolutely. Wally, will you read to us a little bit from Night Thoughts right now? Is that okay? Would you... Yes. reading from the essay. I call it an essay, but it's a, a lot of pieces uh, that uh, are linked together and also juxtaposed against each other. Well, that's that's why it's hard to read a piece because the, I don't know, the value of the book, if it has one, is in the juxtaposition of a lot of different pieces, but I'm going to read a section that might make sense. Uh, by itself, which is about, um, I would say, revenge and punishment. Uh, and I'm even skipping around here in my own essay, but... We all naturally dream of revenge. It's one of the most enjoyable and thrilling of fantasies. We all become excited when we imagine the day when those whom we've learned to despise, those whom we feel have gotten away with so much for so long, will finally pay a price, will finally receive the reward they've earned. And yet, a person who takes revenge at that very moment becomes too powerful. The person who punishes at that very moment becomes too powerful. Revenge and punishment both imply, even if I'd been you and I'd had your life, I would never have done what you did. And that in turn implies, I wouldn't have done it because I'm better than you. But the person who says I'm better than you is taking a serious step in a very dangerous direction. And the person who says, even if I'd had your life, I would never have done what you did, is very probably wrong. There's a thing inside each of us that we experience as the will, the I. We're all aware that there are warring impulses inside us, and sometimes we feel that our will is on one side and some powerful internal force is on the other side. Some people struggle not to drink alcohol. There's an institute in Sweden that helps principled people who find themselves struggling with a sexual attraction to children. In privileged societies, many people struggle with themselves not to eat the extra rolls that remain sitting on the table when the dinner is over. We all go through various sorts of struggles and sometimes the thing we experience as our I wins and sometimes it loses. What we don't know, though, is whether it was ever possible for that struggle to have a different outcome from the one it had. Bernard Madoff 
was an intelligent and successful New York business executive who swindled a great many people out of an extraordinary amount of money. Radovan Karadzic was a Bosnian Serb psychiatrist and politician who committed many war crimes during the 1990s Bosnian war. Did Madoff have the ability not to swindle his clients? Did Karadzic have the ability not to massacre people? And what about me? If I'd been in their circumstances, would I have done the things they did? Possibly not if I were still me. But if I had had Madoff's brain and Madoff's life, I would have been Madoff. And I think I would have done what Madoff did. And if I'd had Karadzic's brain and had had Karadzic's life, I would have been Karadzic. And I think I would have done what Karadzic did. And consequently, I can't help feeling that the whole apparatus of blame, judging, hatred toward those who've done terrible things is fundamentally wrong and ought to be discarded. And that punishment and revenge are based on assumptions that are fundamentally false because there's absolutely no way to determine that the person being punished or the person against whom revenge is taken was capable of behaving differently from the way they behaved. Jordan, thank you very much for that reading, Molly. I, I can't tell viewers how interesting and thoughtful your, um, your night thoughts are because they roam all over the place, as you say, including thoughts on Beethoven, thoughts on courtly Japan, and really asking us to, to question issues of society, civilization, morality. You also, um, briefly, because I, I know we do have to move on, but I just wanted to ask you before we move to Caroline, um, you talk about, in, in the essay, you talk about some of the world's elite turning against complex thought in general and the cultivation of the intellect in particular, even to turn against complex pleasures. That notion of anti-intellectualism is something we discuss a lot in New Zealand as well as in the States. And I wonder, what do you mean by complex pleasures? Well, I suppose that, uh, you know, Schoenberg's music or Beethoven's late quartets are, are complicated compared to uh, the, the popular songs that, that we all enjoy. I'm sure I enjoy them as much as anybody, but, uh, and it would take a while to describe what does it mean by, uh, what does complexity mean, how you define it, but uh, you've got to put more of yourself out there probably to focus on Schoenberg or on Beethoven's late quartets than you do uh, with, the, with the popular song, which, which goes farther distance to get you into it. No, absolutely. Um, and I'm just thinking about uh, some of Deborah Eisenberg's stories in this context as well. Both of you, I suppose, as artists are creating objects of, of complex pleasure or and demanding all sorts of things from your, your readers or your viewers, um, your audiences. And that's why your work is so rewarding. Uh, Wally, please, you two don't go away. Don't wander away into the street. Uh, remain in lockdown for a little while while we talk to Caroline and then I'm going to bring you back so we can all talk together. Kia ora, Wally. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Great. Now, um, our final guest today, Caroline Barron. She's the author of the very moving and honest Rapiro Beach, a memoir of life after near death. This is Caroline's debut book and evidence of an exciting new sensibility. She is already a maven, as I would call her, a book reviewer and commentator, a trustee at the Michael King Writers Center, which is our national center for writers residencies. And of course, a graduate of mine at the Master of Creative Writing at the University of Auckland. Kia ora, Caroline. Kia ora, Paula. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Well, it's lovely to have you here. Now, when I first met you, 
in 2015, you were writing a very good novel set in Auckland in the 40s and 50s, sort of excavating relationships in the shadow of war. Now, mm -hmm. some of that material was based on family history, and you soon moved your attention from the novel to the memoir. And I wondered, why did this book become so urgent for you to write? Well, great question, Paula. Um, well, I think that the hardest thing I find as a, as a writer is trying to figure out how to tell the story. And Ripiro Beach, as you say, had um, its humble beginnings in that manuscript that I came to the MCW with. But what I realized is that the story that I was really trying to tell wasn't just a story of family history. It was actually my story and the story of a combination of these things. And I, I had to be further enough away from the happenings for me to be able to write about them, to give that narrative sort of distance. And as soon as I realized that it had to be a memoir, it really just started pouring forth. It was as if the story had to be told. And I think a lot of the coincidences in the revealing of all this information that seemed to just come to me through these open doors, that was also a part of it, that the story really had to be told. And how did your own sense of mortality around the near-death experience that you describe and also the death of one of your dearest friends send you so deep into the past and questions about your, your family identity and your inheritance, as it were? Gosh, well, I think my father being adopted, and he died many years ago now, but I, I think the fact that he was adopted had been really on my mind my whole life because there was a whole it seemed as though there was a whole sort of part of our family history and part of the blood that's rolling around inside me that I that I didn't know or understand and so when I had my own children uh, that seemed to become a lot more urgent to find out what was who were those people and and what impact did they have on me but unfortunately much of the stuff that I found out was really traumatic so on top of the near-death experience that I'd had I just found that it sort of chipped away at me and chipped away at me. And, and what that eventuated in with the death of Caro, my dear friend, my near-death experience, my father dying on my 20th birthday, what it felt like was as though death was going to sneak up on me at any moment. And that was a horrible, horrible feeling. And so all of this excavating of family history, I guess, was my attempt in trying to um, protect me against it, you know, know thy enemy. That was my way of, of trying to make sure that I could prevent history from repeating itself. When you talk in, in really vivid detail about the, your experience of physical pain, because you've ongoing issues of physical pain, mm -hmm. you in fact recommended a chiropractor to me who you write about in the book. We've now both written about him in books. He's the most famous <laughs> chiropractor in Auckland. But you also write about the, the terrible psychic pain of, of, as you say, fearing your own mortality. Mm -hmm. um, it, part of your journey, if, uh, sorry to use that terrible word that is now completely ruined by uh, television, mm. um, but in what, in part of your journey was um, discovering your own Maori heritage and mm. taking Maori uh, te reo classes. And I wondered, why, was, why do you think that became so important to you? Well, it felt at the time that discovery was a, a little bit of a ray of light through the cracks in the darkness, I guess, and and I did cling on to that, and it's been a really wonderful path to wander down. And it's, you know, it would seem that in the book, it's a it's a really, you know, it takes up sort of the second half of the book, um, the rediscovery of that aspect of my life, and 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 part of that book was written in real time as it was happening. So what you see there is that 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 excitement and that interest and that unfurling of that understanding. And also to know why my father had such dark skin, to be able to understand him. You know, he never knew. He died never knowing that he was Māori. So I felt like, in a way, that that was a homage to him also, to understand that part of history, and for my daughters, so that they will understand it too. There's a, a slight resonance between your book and, and Wally's essay, that you also talk about being born lucky, Mm. Yet part of your memoir is really about dealing with depression and PTSD, um, and not just in you, but in those who went before you, particularly the scars of war. And you talk about how in New Zealand we're not very good with admitting to it or dealing with it. Would you talk a little more about that and how you had to come to terms with admitting something was wrong? 
Oh yeah, that was really, really hard. And in fact, when my, my wonderful mum uh, read an early version of the manuscript, she was absolutely shocked that all of this had been going on and no one, no one knew and she didn't know. So that was really hard for mum. And in a sense, it's actually brought us closer together, I think, um, being able to connect on this deeper level. But I think that's the way for many people and especially people who consider themselves or are considered to be really strong people, or strong women or a super mom or all of that. Uh, so it's really hard to admit to put your hand up and say, I need help. And what I've found so far, and this has just been such an incredible thing with Vipero Beach, is that people who read it feel that they can then open up to their whanau or their friends or to me. So hopefully this book helps people know that there's no need to suffer for such a long time. But yeah, Kiwis, Kiwis need to ask for help more, as we know. Um, but the best thing that I did was to ask for help. And it was really hard, you know, um, those sessions, those EMDR sessions that I did to deal with the PTSD were absolutely heartbreakingly difficult. But it's the only way that I have managed to kind of rejuggle that um, feeling inside me. And so that that beautiful feeling of, of luck in life, that golden tinge that you can have on a life. And that's returned. And I'm just so grateful that I was brave enough, I think, to do that and had the support of my family to do that. Just one thing I want to say briefly, Caroline, before we move on. It was only in reading your book that I discovered that, that you took citalopram and for anxiety and depression. And I never knew that about you. And I don't think you know about me that I take it as well. Because <laughs> even amongst people we know, we don't we don't talk about things that are sort of intrinsic to our lives. So I thought that was very interesting. Wow. Um, I know I want you to read a bit from your book, and I, I just want to talk a little bit before you do about um, your real grandparents or the the parents that um, that your father had, and we never knew because he was adopted as a baby, and both of them end up dying quite tragically. The grand the grandfather that he or the father he never knew dies actually in Mount Eden prison and then his mother dies also in a very tragic way. Mm. How shocking was it for you to discover all this this pain in, in your family's very recent past that no one was aware of? Look, it was really, really difficult to to deal with all of that at the time on top of everything else that I'd been going through because I was expecting, I mean, I love a good detective case, you know, I, I love looking into the past and into history and revealing things and that's part of being a writer. But when every story that I uncovered, when every person that I found had a tragic end, it really broke me down because I thought, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for my children? You know, am I sipping from that same cup? If, if, if part of me has their genes, what does that mean for me? And I'm just really lucky and grateful that there was some, there were some lights along the way, you know, the Māori journey um, and also meeting Fano, such as Stephen Stanaway, who was Montague's son and Auntie Janice, as I call her, Lynette's daughter. It's been a real um, ray of light and a connection, I guess. Now, Lynette was your father's real mother or birth mother. Um, the the mm. excerpt you're going to read from the memoir relates to her, does it not? It does, yes. It's from a part where I'm in Cox's Bay and I'm trying to find the place that she um, that she died. Would you read that for us, please? Sure. I cross back over the road and a woman I recognise but can't place winds past me, her terrier tugging at its red lead. Hi Caroline, she says brightly. Oh, hi, how are you? I say on automatic pilot. My cheeks are hot and I stuff my phone in my handbag. What are you up to? She says. I stare, trying to place her, feeling as though I've been caught out. Um, not much, I say. I couldn't. Who was she? And how could I put into words what I was doing? She frowns as if she smells a rat. Well, nice to see you, she says, turning away. Enjoy your walk, I mumble, too late. Ugh. This damn fog that is wrapped around my brain, this inability to think clearly. I feel stupid that I can't remember who she is. And it's not until later that day I realize we've known each other well for a time. It happens a lot. Sometimes like today, it's matching a name to a face. Other times it's trying to remember I've caught my keys. Once we'd walk halfway home from school when I remembered I'd left our dog Dexter tied up at the gate. These moments frighten me. I'm scared that I'm slipping away. Sometimes, more than I care to admit, the fog stirs the ocean surface and waves rip through my mind, sweeping up everything in its wake. 
just yesterday I'd been bathing the girls and they were having a happy time playing and splashing. It was fine for a while and I thought, oh, how nice it was. But then Georgia spilled a cup of water on the floor and Hazel splashed her sister in the face and they both started crying and in an instant my whole body clenched, adrenaline rushing through me and I had no say over what happened next. I tore out the plug and yanked the girls too roughly from the tub. Why can't you just bloody listen for once in your lives? I, yeah, I yelled, I've had enough. I wrapped them in towels and pushed them out the bathroom door. Hazel ran to her room, bawling, her towel trailing behind her. Georgia fixed me with a stare. Why are you so mean to us, mummy? Her face crumpled and she ran to her bedroom. I hung up the bath mat, breathed shallow and felt as though I was battling for survival. I caught my reflection in the mirror. My eyes were flinty pieces of coal and I couldn't bear to look at myself. And then I was crying too because I didn't know why I just lost it like that and I didn't know how to stop myself from being such an awful, awful person. Here, now, at Cox's Bay, I calm myself by breathing in the trees and sky then begin to follow the path that tracks the creek away from the sea. Water glistens beneath rugby posts and patches of grassless bog edge the field. Every few minutes I veer off, pushing aside branches to steer down at the creek, calculating the likelihood of this being the place a 65-year-old woman would have made her final leap, each time thinking, mm, not here. Janice told me Lynette went for a walk on the day she died. When she didn't return home, Elio, her husband of 21 years, went to find her. He was blind by then, Janice told me, so must have followed the commotion to where the police had dragged his wife's life lifeless body from the creek, near where she'd laid her yellow raincoat over the back of a park bench. They questioned him, suspicious of the gash on the back of her head, but eliminated him as a suspect. Their marriage hadn't been great those last years, Janice said, but there was no way Elio was a murderer. Police eventually determined Lynette had hit her, hit her head on the concrete pipe when she jumped. The path connects to a boardwalk, the pittosporum and cabbage trees giving way to wider banks of estuary mud where oi oi grass tufts between mangroves that corks grew out of the mire. Jez and I used to walk our do dogs here in 2007 when we lived on Grosvenor Street back before we were married or had children, back when I thought I knew who I was. A smell of grave dug earth assaults me and my heart is a newborn chick. Every few meters, I pick my way across the sludgy grass, push aside flax and manuka to peer at the muddy water before tiptoeing back to the path. I do this three or four times. I know I'm getting close, but the bank is not high enough, not high enough to jump from. Concrete pipe, I remind myself. Look for the concrete pipe. Thank you very much, Caroline. I was, I was hoping that you would read even more because it's so it's so, such a fascinating book. Do you feel now you've made this story public? Do you feel, how do you feel? Do you feel exposed? Uh, somewhat, yes, I do feel somewhat exposed, but I do feel that it's worth it if it helps other women, other men to be brave enough to get help and to share their story. Um, Wally and Deborah back into our into our little group because there's something in Caroline's book that I thought we might all want to discuss. Caroline, there's um, a doctor you see at one point mm -hmm. who reminds you not to do too much. And she says, in the world we live in, there are so many false obligations. Mm -hmm. She points out that children have no opportunity to be still, to get bored, to play. And I'm thinking that this is very true for adults as well and for artists as we all are, that we need time to be still, reflect, disappear, play. And Wally, you call the night a wonderful blessing because that's when we can stop and possibly make a, full, uh, a new start in the morning. And I wondered how each of you um, considered shedding yourselves of false obligations. Do you do that in your lives? And how do you find ways to start again in a different way. De Deborah, have you got any interest in answering this? Interest, yes. Ability, probably not. Um, I mean, I'm certainly interested in the question and it seems particularly pressing. Uh, I mean, more and more increasingly pressing and uh, I didn't start, you know, I'm in my mid seventies now and I didn't start using the computer until I was uh, over 50, I think. And I, to have this thing that's, it's never asleep, it's never quiet, 
It's always coming at you. It's always, I mean, and I'm just using this as a representative, uh, a representative phenomenon of our world. Um, but I think of people who are younger than I am, who have lived with this much longer or all their lives, the feeling of actually sort of pointless pressures and obligations and demands never, never, never going away. You know, that you can get pinged or, or you're, I mean, the surveillance uh, uh, apparatus of the whole world, you're always placed, you're always available, uh, and you're always accountable. And really, uh, I myself am so constituted that I can deal with very little. As I said, I'm incredibly slow. And I just can't deal with all the stimulus coming in. And I... I don't know how to answer your question. I just say your question is a huge question that's amplified by by our lives at uh, at every moment now. Yeah, so. nobody cares that you that your life is being swallowed up and your time is being swallowed up. Uh, you don't get any sympathy for that. And uh, boy, your doctor was right on the money, I think. Uh, yes, we, I mean, the only thing we have to offer is our, is our thoughts really, our, our insights. I mean, you know, most, most of us don't uh, have any valuable thoughts or insights, but that's what a writer is, is, is someone who ought to be able to, uh, devote a large proportion of his time to uh, just taking in the world. That's our value if we have any. Um, and nobody wants to help us. And uh, yeah, you have to fight very viciously to get uh, you know, those minutes. How do you do? I know how do we do that, but Deborah, I mean, it's essential to your process that that entering into a story, not knowing where it's going, seeing where it's going, being present in the writing of it, um, it's absolutely crucial to the way you write. So you absolutely need time, don't you? Yes. Which we could call playtime, the way we did when we were children. Exactly, it's exactly playtime. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, really not knowing. Not, not knowing anything and not being efficient and not being useful and not being effective and, um, and being able to uh, endure uh, the reproach from outside or from inside about being a completely useless person. And uh, we've been talking about luck, I mean, Wally and Caroline so eloquently about, about good fortune in life. And I had the strange good fortune of not being good at things and being sort of considered a useless and absurd person. So I was free from a lot of pressure that people who are good at things or do feel compelled to live up to some ideal of responsibility and, and strength, as Caroline said, that I, I didn't have to deal with that as much as most other people. And Caroline, this is absolutely something you've had to deal with because I didn't say in your introduction, you used to own your own model agency. You've let, led a very busy com, you know, commercial professional life. You always seemed to me when I first met you to be busy about town, in charge, wonderful mother, lovely home, gorgeous husband, he's really good looking, uh, who's also very able. You were always rushing about everywhere, but now I find that actually it, it, it's also a struggle for you to 
as Deborah says, fight those voices inside and make time for yourself to be absurd and useless. Mm -hmm. uh, well, finding our place, uh, our Tūranga Waiwai, Ripiro Beach, was the, the second best piece of luck that I've ever had. The first uh, being marrying that gorgeous, handsome, very able man you were just talking about. Uh, but lockdown was really interesting for us because it meant that I could, um, in between homeschooling two primary school age children, I'd go on these long, long walks and I would just think, you know, I would just think and walk. And that just gave me space. I felt like I was in the footsteps of Rebecca Solnit or Olivia Lang and some of those um, wonderful people who have written about walking. And I would just think. And out of those, that, that time of thinking came some really great ideas and great stories. So you need to fight viciously. Like you said, Wally, you need to fight viciously for that time. And if you're serious about writing, you've got to do it. I really like the idea, Caroline, for you and me, of embracing uh, Deborah's exhortation to be absurd and useless as well. <laughs> I'm definitely going to channel that, Deborah. Thank you. I think we need to be we need to be much more useless because we need to be conniving, as James Joyce said. Well, we need silence, exile, and cunning. We need to be much more cunning about making that room uh, in our lives for daydreaming and playtime. I see a writer's retreat coming up, Paula. <laughs> Listen, it has been so wonderful to talk to you three today, and I'm, I can hear the, the town hall clock tolling in the background, and I, I feel that, that we must stop um, very frustratingly because, of course, at the actual Auckland Writers' Festival, we, you would have had an hour each to talk, and instead we're cramming this in, but it's been incredibly interesting. Um, thank you so much to Deborah Eisenberg, to Wallace Shawn, and to Caroline Barron and to everyone else who has made this episode possible, especially the Auckland Writers Festival team, Auckland Live and Copyright Licensing New Zealand. Kia ora also to our generous sponsors and patrons and partners listed on the festival's website. Thank you so much for your ongoing support during these strange times. Thank you as well to our audience. Remember, you can view this episode again at le your leisure on the festival website. You can look online for the podcasts coming up of uh, Wallace Shawn's two plays that he has uh, either made or is making. Um, remember the 2020 festival program, fantastic reading guide for the year. If you'd like a copy, um, just pop to the festival website and they will send one out to you. Please uh, tune in again next week when our guests will be the British food and travel writer Yasmin Khan discussing her latest book, Zaitun, Recipes and Stories from the Palestinian Kitchen. We made one of the recipes already. It's fantastic. Richard Ford, the iconic American novelist and short story writer with his just published collection, Sorry for Your Trouble. And someone that Caroline knows very well, our very own Amy McDade, uh, joining us to discuss her fabulous debut novel, Fake Baby. Thank you so much to our writers. See you all same time, same place next week. Hi, Dana.